been a great pleasure to join the Sun Valley Institute family and tribe over the last year and help uh, be part of the process of organizing this conference and be able to invite some of my close friends. So without further ado, in, in lieu of time, I'll start with introducing uh, Jay Lemery. So Jay Lemery and I uh, became colleagues, but he corrected me to say besties. Well, was that fair? <laughs> All right, Jay. Um, we became uh, besties, uh, basically teaching people how to take care of each other, take care of themselves in the wilderness environment um, as wilderness medicine physicians. Jay has been really, though, one of the influential voices arguing that we must also take care of our environment to take care of our health. As Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Colorado and Chief of the Section of Environmental or Wilderness and Environmental Medicine, uh, he not only has academic expertise in austere and remote medical care, but also on the impact of climate change on health. So he serves as consultant for the Climate and Health Program at the Centers for Disease Control and sits on the National Academy of Medicine's Roundtable on Environmental Health Sciences. Jay's textbook, Global Climate Change and Human Health from Science to Practice and recent publication that just came out, Enviromedics, are important canons, really, in this conversation about climate change and health. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend, Jay Lemery. Thanks, Bestie. <laughs> Great to see you. It's so exciting to be here. Thank you for having me. So. Um, just to kind of echo what, <clears throat> what Terry said, I'm just going to tell you how I got to where I got because I think it helps shape the narrative, which I'm going to share with you. Um, I got involved with uh, wilderness medicine right out of residency. I'm from upstate New York. I trained in New York City. Um, I took a job in New York City, and uh, I, I, liked the, um, uh, I liked wilderness medicine. It was a great way to teach, and it was very germane in that post-9-11 and also the ascendancy of global health. And so we started a program at Wild Cornell right in Manhattan. And this is uh, us teaching in the Adirondacks in the fall and the Southwest in the uh, spring. And then moved to the uh, University of Colorado and then began supporting, um, kept the program going, grew it at CU and began to support um, extreme medicine in really exotic and awesome places, you know, very delicate, pristine, and cool places that people travel to. So we helped our friends set up the Everspace Camp Medical Clinic. I was, uh, for two years, the EMS medical director for the U.S. Antarctic program, and now flip poles, and now um, I'm one of the medical directors for the NSF, supporting science and research in the uh, circumpolar north. And as we're supporting the science and getting to know these places, it just became this gaping, conspicuous absence. You know, where is the healthcare community in this larger conversation of uh, climate change and its effect on health? Um, and particularly when it was becoming politicized, the science was being bashed and warped for political, um, uh, political ends, which was very concerning. And so I became very, um, I was in a bit of a crisis about a, a 10 years ago, and my, my uh, mentor wrote an essay in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's a two-pager, a very elegant essay explaining why physicians um, and the healthcare community as a whole really needed to pay attention to this. Um, and it just struck me, and it, it just resonated in my heart. And I wrote my own essay a couple years later in Wilderness and Environmental Medicine, a smaller journal. I'm glad to see some people here a little bit older. I, I give this lecture to the med students, and they're like, strange love. Was he, was he, was he pathology lab last year? Which, which one was he? Um, which echoes the absurdity, you know, doc, the movie Dr. Strangelove, the absurdity of nuclear proliferation. And we recall that time in the early 80s when um, the doctrine of detente switched, and, be, and it, we heard that nuclear wars could become winnable, right? very scary, um, at which point um, oops, um, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War were formed. Uh, healthcare providers from both sides of the Iron Curtain came together and said unequivocally, nuclear war is the final epidemic with no meaningful cure. They put a health face on something existential, scary, politicized, with maybe no one felt particularly uh, enabled to deal with, right? Sound familiar? Um, and I think this is, the, this is the historic opportunity I think, again, healthcare has. And because of that, of course, they won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, essentially, this is, the, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm all about, changing the left side to the right side. Instead of, I love polar bears, instead of polar bears on icebergs, switch it to kids with inhalers. 
and really hammer home this, the power of science communication, which we in healthcare, NPs, PAs, paramedics, doctors, we all have, because all we do all day long is translate abstract science into deliverable healthcare messages. We're, we're really good at this. Um, again, thank you again for some of us being a little older. You know this guy. I knew him from reruns. I see some prime time here. Marcus Welby, MD, right? Epitomized the doctor-patient relationship, right? He spent all his time with his patients. There was no joint commission. He was never sued. He smoked. But again, this, we still hold that public trust in healthcare. We still have it, and this is our relative advantage. Because the truth is, we gotta get away from altruism. Love Mother Earth, um, save the world, or abstractions, 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. What the hell does that mean for most people, right? We in this room probably know 400's a big deal. It's a threshold we surpassed a couple years ago. Um, but, and, and the media covered it extensively, but it has very little meaning. And I think we gotta get away from that and start talking about our parents' risk of chronic lung disease, our kids' risk of asthma. Here's the money slide. It's from the CDC, and it elegantly tells us what is going on. The inner circle is the forces, rising temperatures, extreme weather, uh, sea level rise, carbon dioxide increase. Uh, the second circle is the changes that those forces have on the environment. The outer circle is what happens to, to uh, human beings. What's the pathophysiology of that? And that's what we really wanted to just pay attention to when we came up with this book. I co-edited it with George Luber at the CDC. And um, you know, it's 600 and 672 pages of wonkery. It's just really dense, but it's all there. And the idea was we gotta get this into the med schools. We gotta get into public health schools. We gotta get into college because we have to start teaching this in a scientific manner. And I hear from students, these bright, shiny students every year come up to me and say, hey, Lemry, we read your book. They didn't read the book. No one can read that book. It's 672 pages. It's a textbook. That's the problem. So then we're like, we got to write another book. This one we actually authored with my co-author. Remember that guy, Auerbach? And um, what we did with Environmetics is we took the reader to the bedside and have we break it down in, in, uh, in, in lay narrative and say, uh, you know, it's the hottest day of the year in the South Bronx, and Sally ran out of her inhaler. You know, it used to be only two weeks, now it's all summer, right? And we, we speak to those emergency medicine vignettes, stuff that Terry and I do all day long, and we say, this is an asthma attack, we know sickness, this is sickness. And that's the real message. And we wanted to take the reader to the bedside so we could better characterize what is going on every summer, right? We have our own version this summer, this is last summer. Hurricanes in Puerto Rico, flooding major American cities, wildfires throughout the American West, um, we re remember Katrina, the worst one we've had in a long time. It was an urban flood from an extreme weather event. So um, with that said, what are we doing in healthcare? Um, you know, and we've moved this forward. We're being aggressive. We started the first physician fellowship to train doctors to be savvy in climate science, human pathophysiology from that science, and probably most important to be outstanding communicators, to be in the room, and uh, in places like the CDC and the NIHS to be able to help shape policy and say, we're at the bedside, we know what's going on, and then share that with public and policymakers. Um, the goal of this is to take a flashlight, shine a light on it, and give it a name. And that's something where I think we've been, um, we've been remiss and, re and have not been successful in doing that. Um, okay, so how, what is this, how does this affect change? Well, we, we got lucky in an opportunity it was certainly unlucky for the people of Puerto Rico. Uh, last um, fall, a devastating hurricane, right? This is a, if you want to understand climate change, it's a disease of vulnerability, okay? This is, this is a vulnerable place, and it was pummeled by an extreme weather event. Remember that CDC chart? Extreme weather event. So in uh, the fall last year, the Institute of Forensic Sciences, which handles the um, death certificates for the island, came out with the official death toll, right? We knew this was grossly underestimated, and um, we have friends at the at Harvard, um, where some of our, I'm a fellow at this uh, Institute for Health and Human Rights at Harvard, and they uh, had people calling that institute saying, can you please help us? This is wrong. We need data. And so we said, let's put the team together. So we sent our fellow, and we went around and did a sample of uh, Puerto Rico to the best that we could with the money that we had, and we were very lucky because it struck a chord in uh, academic medicine, and we came up with a landmark paper that came out over Memorial Day on um, uh, excess mortality in Puerto Rico after the hurricane. 
Um, Sherry Fink of the New York Times broke the story right after the Tuesday after Memorial Day. The Washington Post put it on its cover and then it went bonkers, right? You remember all this? So everyone's tweeting about it. We had the lefties weigh in, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Cynthia Nixon was tweeting about it. And then um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders and uh, actually CIA Director Gina Haspel criticized our methods, um, which, was, which was interesting. And then, um, but then we saw real change, right? That's, that's fun and buzzy and viral and hooray, but these are real people really suffering after the spike in, in, in viral social media. The mayor of San Juan uh, put 4645 in her hat. To be clear, that's the mean of our estimate. Our estimate went from 800 to 8,000. That's the middle number. So that's not the number, it's just the mean. And then um, people began to take this into their own hands and probably uh, the most important thing I think has come out of it is that it forced a change at the governmental level to be more transparent, to shine a flashlight on it and say, here's what's really happening. Um, the goal of this, of course, is to change our collective risk assessment to say that this is a problem because the truth is life will be fine, earth will be fine. Earth loved it when parts per million of carbon dioxide were 800, right? Plants were going bonkers. It's the homo sapiens that are in trouble, okay? And once we can change our risk assessment, we can start making uh, better choices, better energy choices, understand the importance of clean air, uh, the importance of uh, loss of biodiversity to our long-term health, uh, access to clean water, and the scourge of extreme weather events. Um, by doing that, uh, we can envision climate change as a health issue, uh, empower a rationale for action to realize our human potential. Thank you. Uh, Jay, that was amazing, and I already love the forum. That was super incredible, fantastic. Uh, our next speaker is really easy for me to introduce because that's what she does for her work. And pictures are worth a thousand words, right? Um, fellow Patagonia ambassador Kimmy Warner is, a, is an artist. She spends more time underwater on a breath hold than most of us do above land. She, she hunts for her own food. Um, she's just a general badass. Please, please welcome my good friend, an amazing human being, Kimmy Warner. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so my first picture was taken nine years ago. So this was in 2009, and this was at the United States National Spearfishing Freediving Championships. And I was standing alongside my mentor who was just ecstatic and proud because we had just taken second in the nation. However, behind my smile, I actually felt quite disappointed in myself, frustrated, and I went home that night feeling like a huge loser. The year before, I had won first in the nation, and I had also won every tournament leading up to this day. So that night, I really had to ask myself, am I this bad of a loser? And as I continued, I did some international tournaments after this that I won first in, but I still didn't go home feeling happy. The victory started to feel empty and so did I. And so I really started questioning this whole path I was on. And as I was training for future events, I would look at my training partners and I would start to ask questions like, why is it important to us to be better than other people? And he, they would say to me, like, Kimmy, don't think of it that way. Like, the whole point of this is to be your best. And I said, yeah, but I can be my best without having to be better than the person next to me. So why is that important to us? And I never really got any clear-cut answers, but I did totally start to understand that I didn't like the effect the competition was starting to have on me personally. And I also realized that the more I put an emphasis on being better or superior to others, the less I was actually enjoying my time spent underwater. And that to me was the biggest tragedy. And so I walked away. And when I walked away, my friends all were certain that I was having some sort of mental meltdown and they were <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> because I was lost, depressed, and confused. And I had really made this decision at such an inconvenient time because I honestly was right on the brink of making it. 
being able to actually make a life and even a living for myself with time spent underwater. And I had only been spearfishing for four years. My love for spearfishing came a lot earlier. It actually came when I was four years old because I got to watch my dad bring up these catches from the ocean to feed us as a family. I grew up on the island of Maui in this little town called Haiku, and my family was extremely, extremely poor at the time. We'd often have to forage for food just to feed ourselves. And my dad's favorite way of doing that was by going spearfishing to legitimately just put food on the table. When I was about four or five years old, he started letting me tag along. And he always jokes that it's really because he just couldn't afford to hire a babysitter, and so he had no other choice. But regardless of why, I fell in love. I wasn't able, I was way too young to like touch a spear, but I loved being his tag along, and I loved being his number one cheerleader as I would clap as he would bring up my favorite dinners to eat. But shortly after this, my life changed dramatically because both of my parents worked really hard and soon they both made really good money. And so we moved out of the boonies and into a subdivision and we no longer had to depend on nature to get our food. In fact, we no longer even had to think about where our food came from. From that day on, I lived a very, very civilized life. And it wasn't until I was 24 years old that I finally decided to pick up a spear. I had all these memories and nostalgia just kind of calling me back and finally one day I realized I had to see what it was about. And the minute I picked up a spear, it honestly felt like somebody had handed me this superpower that I never knew I had but that had been waiting for me my whole life. And that blew me away because I had never known what it felt like to really be good at anything, especially anything I love. And so with the people who helped teach me, we decided to see how far I could take it. Three years later, I had won the national championships in Rhode Island, and it was my first time diving outside of Hawaii. And a year after that, I was quitting. And again, the hardest part about this wasn't just letting down my friends or wasn't just the depression, but it was knowing that I was giving up any chance of making a life or a living, you know, based on time spent underwater. So instead, I decided to make a living being a starving artist. <laughs> I painted paintings, but I also painted trucker hats because they sold a lot better than my paintings did. <laughs> and basically, I would just paint all the fish I would see in the ocean onto trucker hats, and that's how I would pay my rent and pay my bills every month. So you can imagine how many hats I had to paint every day. <laughs> but I also returned to the ocean, and at first I left my spear gun behind. I just wanted to reconnect with this source that fed me. I stopped looking at the big trophy fish and started instead spending time with the fish on the bottom of the food chain, the ones that fed me as a kid. Soon I decided to plant a garden and start spearfishing again just to feed myself. It helped me subsidize the high cost of food and living in Hawaii. Sometimes I'd have enough fish to share and the thing about my relationship with fish that's often hard to explain to people is that I have such a love and such a respect for my prey. I think when you actually have to hold your breath and swim to the bottom of the ocean in so many ways, you have to become a fish yourself. And when you do that, and when you study them, and when you get to know them so much, there's this deep appreciation for the life that you take and the importance of the nourishment it's gonna bring you and the fact that none of it should ever be wasted. And so as I would share my fish here and there, I'd always follow back with people and say, hey, how do you like that fish? How'd you cook it? Did you enjoy it? And sometimes the answers I would get would be things like, oh, right, that fish, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I think it's just, I think it's in the freezer. I think I just, I put it there after you gave it to me. And I would immediately mentally cross that person off my list. <laughs> and soon, like a crazy woman, I started going through great efforts and great lengths just to get whatever extra fish I had into the hands of people who I knew would appreciate it and honor it the same way I did. Even if I meant I had to drive all the way across the island, I would do it. 
And by doing that, something amazing happened. In the days and in the weeks to follow, I started seeing chicken eggs left at my door. I started seeing mangoes and avocados from people's trees. Garden greens and even coolers full of venison from local bow hunters because it turned out that the people who I was choosing because I knew that they'd appreciate my harvest were like-minded people who also had the same care and concern for the resources that they had at hand. Soon, I barely had to go spearfishing once a week because I had so much food coming through my door I couldn't eat it all. And because of that, I also saved some money and I finally started traveling again. But this time I wasn't traveling for competition. I was traveling to go diving and to meet the locals from other places. And I wanted to ask them questions. I told them that the own ocean in my front yard looked a lot different from the memories I had at four years old. The colors of the reefs were different, the fish stocks were different, and I wanted to know what they were seeing in their own front yard. I got to know local fishermen from different tribes and villages and ask them these questions. I got to meet politicians and leaders of island nations and ask them these questions too. And eventually I even got to meet the world's top conservationists and scientists and not only do research with them, but ask them my questions. And as I learned, I started to write. And I would post it on anything I possibly could just to make this information public because I knew this valuable knowledge doesn't do any good if it's just going around in the same little circles. And as I wrote, a following grew. And this time, instead of trading mangoes and avocados, we were sharing ideas and thoughts, and sometimes disagreeing, and sometimes being controversial, but nonetheless having conversations. We shared what we learned about climate change, about coral bleaching, about development, about water runoff, about overfishing, about plastic pollution. And I also shared the victories I was seeing. I, I shared the fish stocks that were making comebacks because of proper management. Island nations like Palau, who totally banned commercial foreign fishing industries to protect their own ice box and now have flourishing ecosystems. And I also just shared the beauty of what I was seeing because I really believe that if we fall in love with something, we'll want to protect it. So I shared the beauty and the creatures that I was meeting along the way. The wonderful great white shark ride that I had in Mexico the most friendly sea lions I ever met in my life on the Juan Fernandez Archipelago of Chile. These animals were once on the brink of ex extinction, but due to protection are now flourishing. A whale shark in La Paz. And this is a sperm whale in Dominica. And if you look carefully at the picture, it had thrashed its tail, approached me on the surface, flipped upside down and opened its mouth and showed me all of its teeth. And I did get kind of scared, but I learned right after that from the scientists I was with that it just so happened that when we crossed paths, I was directly in front of this whale. Sperm whales have the biggest head on the whole planet. And so being directly in front of it, it simply couldn't see me with both eyes at the same time. <laughs> the only way it could was by flipping upside down. And their hearing comes from the inside, so just to hear me, it opened its mouth. And once it realized and took me in, it just gently passed me by. Dolphins in Hawaii, humpback whales in Tonga, sea angels from the Arctic, and penguins from Antarctica. The ice of the Arctic, and even the unicorns of the sea, and the narwhals, are all things that I've been able to experience and share along the way. And I honestly have to pinch myself sometimes because not only do I now make a life and living off of time spent underwater, but it's one that's much more authentic to what's truly important to me. And I think that this thought really sank in 
the day that I was called in 2013 and I was told that I was being inducted into the Spearfishing Freediving Hall of Fame. Because this is something that was really like a goal of mine in the beginning. I wanted to be inducted as a competitor. You can be inducted as a competitor or a contributor, but being a contributor means that you've like invented a new spear gun or a new style of fin that really innovates the sport. To be inducted as a competitor, you simply need to earn enough points. And it turned out that in my very, very short time of competing, I had earned enough points to be the first female and youngest person inducted into the Hall of Fame. But when the pioneers and the legends of spearfishing read off this proclamation, I heard them say that I was being inducted as a competitor and a contributor. I looked at them thinking that they made a mistake and they went on to say, that I contributed an immense amount of environmental awareness to the spearfishing and fishing communities to which they were eternally grateful. And this really just got me thinking that day that maybe there's another reason why I had to leave competition. And maybe it's because when it comes to the issues that our world faces, it does us no good to try and be superior to nature or to one another. Because whether you're a competitor or a conservationist, whether you're a hunter or a vegan, whether you have avocados or mangoes, we are all different and that's great because we all have something different to bring to the table and to bring to the conversation. I don't think we're a monochromatic species and I don't think it's a monochromatic world. I truly believe that we are as biodiverse as this beautiful planet, and the more that we embrace that, respect that, and learn to work together, we're gonna make it a better place. So thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker has been a journalist for 46 years, and he was the environmental journalist, journalist for the Statesman uh, since 1996. I'm gonna let that sink in a little bit. He was the environmental journalist in the state of Idaho pretty tough job. Uh, he's also the author of three books, including the acclaimed Scorched Earth about the fires in Yellowstone in 1988, which talked a lot about and made present uh, the policy of fire suppression with the Forest Service for the last 100 plus years, and which are leading, have led to, along with climate change and other issues, to what we now unfondly refer to as smoke season. So we're all very familiar with this now. He's been an articulate and passionate voice for salmon and for dam removal, and we're sorry to hear that he just retired. We just had a great talk with him out in the, in the front, but please welcome Rocky Barker. Thanks, Gavin. I'm, I don't have visuals, but I, I'm gonna bring you guys into this a little bit. What I'd like you to do is everybody close your eyes, get a vision of a place and a time that you've spent out in nature. Think about the sights, the sounds, and even the smells, not just smoke. <laughs> now think about that. that. It's like a movie in your head. And, you know, these moments and the emotions they evoke come back to us through our lives, wherever we go. You know, that's our consciousness working. It's the thing that, it's one of the things that sets us apart, you know, with nature. We are a part of nature, but what makes it fascinating, and we see, see it with our other speakers, is we can communicate in a way uh, about its, its beauty and its wonder. Now, I was lucky as a student to get to know the nature writer and preservationist Sigurd Olson. He's the author of a book written in the 50s called The Singing Wilderness. And he had many other books about the Aquatico Superior Lake Country up in northern Minnesota and Ontario. And he guided me to my way to connect with nature. He wrote in The Singing Wilderness of a day spent at an old estate in the south of England, far from his home in the wilderness. Quote, then suddenly I heard the sound that changed everything, a soft nasal twang from high in the branches, the call of a nuthatch. Instantly that beech grove was transformed into a stand of tall stately pines. The brown beech leaves on the ground became smooth carpet of gold needles. And beyond this, 
cared for forest or rugged ridges and deep timbered valleys, roaring rivers and placid lakes with the smell of resin and duff in the sun. The call of the nuthatch had done all, all that, had given me the vision of the wilderness as vivid as though for the moment I had actually been there. Isn't that what you guys just got to experience? We can, we keep it with us and we can carry it forward. You know, I've spent my year, my career, uh, either connecting with nature or covering people who were. <laughs> what a great job. I ran for my life 30 years ago in the firestorm at Old Fateful in the signal fires of climate change. I watched as the Edwards Dam was breached on the Kennebec River in Maine in 1999, opening up 17 miles to the Atlantic salmon, sea bass, and a dozen other anadromous species that had been shut out since Nathaniel Hawthorne had walked its banks. And then the next day, I got to go out with the people who'd worked their last decade trying to get, make this happen, and we canoed this free-flowing river for the first time in 160 years. I'm telling you, it was a sacred event. I returned to canoe it seven years later, and I saw this rewilded river now teeming with life, just a complete transformation. I got to watch as the first wolves ran into the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness in Idaho in 1995, and a little more than a month later, I was one of the first to hear free wolves howl in Yellowstone National Park. I watched brown bears patrol the shores of Kurilski Lake, uh, red with spawning sockeye salmon in Kamchatka right after the fall of the Soviet Union. I flew over what appeared to be an unbroken wilderness of thousands of square miles in Zambia with Earth First founder Dave Foreman. He looked down and he said, it's all wilderness. And I said, David, it's filled with people, but they still live in the forest. Then we met African villagers who lived there and were protecting the elephants, lions, and other game that lived around them because rich hunters and wildlife watchers paid them. In 2011, I spent a day with hundreds of other conservationists, Indians, and government officials at the ceremony, beginning the removal of the Elwha dams in Washington, in the Olympic Peninsula. The next day, I flew to Maine and paddled in, stro in the strokes of Henry David Thoreau on the west branch of the Penobscot River. Later that year, a big dam was removed downstream, opening up yet another waterway to the fish that were once blocked off. And of course, the same transformation on the Elwha, it is just incredible and the same in the Penobscot. And I'm going to see the day when we see that same thing on the snake. I watched Republican con Congressman Mike Simpson fist bump the late former Interior Secretary and Governor Cecil Andrus to celebrate their victory protecting the Boulder White Clouds uh, Mountains as wilderness. I hiked Simpson the year after it happened, the chief and with the chief of the Forest Service and others to Chamberlain Lake at the base of Castle Peak a year after President Obama had signed it. Today, it is the Cecil Andrus Wilderness. With biologists predicting as much as 20 to 40 percent of all species could be lost this century due to climate change, holding on to every cog and wheel as Aldo Leopold told us to do, uh, we can, it'll require us to move species around and to even engineer for them new habitats, something that is today risky and expensive. But ultimately, we must think differently about how ecosystems and their inhabitants can survive the coming ecological benefit. Making choices isn't easy, nor should it be. I've reported on scientists and other scholars who say we must be prepared to take risks to protect these ecological treasures. This means balancing the need to reduce greenhouse gases with the need to protect biodiversity and other values. 
But most of all, it's going to require realistic thinking that comes, I have found it, in a new generation uh, of people like writer Emma Maris, who's the author of a book called Rambunctious Garden that I highly recommend. Nature is almost everywhere, Maris writes, but whatever, wherever it is, there's one thing that nature is not, pristine. There is no pristine wilderness on Earth. As hard as that is for a person who spent his life in and around wilderness, it's so true. And, greenhouse, and the, the greenhouse gases, the atmosphere, have come already dramatically changed the places we love. Now, Maris grew up in a world where there were no unexplored uh, places on maps. When I was growing up, my parents, ha grandparents had up in their kitchen National Geographic maps, and there were these large areas of unexplored, <laughs> you know, with uh, GPS. There ain't, there's just nothing like that, or Google Maps. <laughs> now, Maris, she, she's still in her 30s, tells us, we already control the Earth, and it's time we admit it. We must temper our romantic notion of untrammeled wildness and find room next to it for a more nuanced notion of a global, half-wild, rambunctious garden tended by us, Maris writes. Now, make no mistake, Emma wants to protect the places that are still wilderness. She doesn't want to, like, change them. Emma's view is uncomforting for many of us boomers who have been seeking to restore a reasonable illusion of ecosystems before they were destroyed by humans. Take, for instance, the baseline. Returning to pre-human or pre-European baseline, Maris wrote, is seen as healing a wounded or sick nature, but it's unrealistic in many cases to return to a place that will never be again. Climate change will destroy or at least move the habitats on which many species we seek to preserve depend. So we're going to need to preserve not only wilderness, but the wildness that connects us with nature. This wildness is our own explanation of the world around us. It inherently is tied to human culture. A place, a predator, a plant does not lose its wildness just because it's touched by our hands. But wildness existed before us. It's a place from where we came. Wildness carved the grooves of ancient truths into our souls. Maris is urging society to expand its vision of conservation to previously ignored areas like canal banks, dried up croplands, blighted urban neighborhoods like Detroit. She and Richard Louv, author of The Nature Principle, argue that we can turn these areas into ecosystems that can bring nature to people and provide ecological services like filtration and carbon sequestration. These areas are not new. Olson said in a talk in Washington, D.C. in 58, quote, it's wonderful to have national parks and forests to go to, but they're not enough. It's not enough to make a trip once a year to see these places occasionally over a long weekend. We need to have places close at hand, breathing spaces in cities and towns, little plots of ground where things have not changed, green belts, oases among the piles of steel and stone. Now, Louvre, best known for his book, Last Child in the Woods, wants to tap nature to boost our mental acuity, creativity, and health. At its heart, he seeks to replace the, uh, the uh, apocalyptic vision that modern society has created. When you ask, this is a quote, when you ask many Americans, if not most, to conjure up what the future will look like, you get Blade Runner, Mad Max, or maybe Cormac McCarthy's The Road, he said. If that's the dominant issue of the future, then we're in trouble. Now we've, you know, I've been a part of the, the environmental movement that's kind of fed this. And he says no movement can succeed if its future is a place where people don't want to go. As he says, Martin Luther King did not have a nightmare. <laughs> Now, Olson, who was an outfitter in the Boundary Waters, took high-stress business ex executives in the 1930s and 40s deep into the wilderness lake country, canoeing across wide lakes and over steep portages. 
He observed that the longer they were away from civilization, the more they would begin to relax and regain their ability to smell the natural world and hear the sounds of nature. My wife tells of her, our trip down the Middle Fork a few years ago. She's not the outdoorsman I am, but she said after that week, she didn't really get back into uh, the norm for another month. It was great. Olson knew that the immersion in nature was an anecdote to technology and, and to urbanization. So as we go forward to carry as much biodiversity and civilization as we can carry through the bottlenecks before us, we will need Sigurd Olson's guidance more than ever. We will need more nature and more wildness than we have today. We'll need more wilds in places that are not wild today. We're going to have to have more trails and portages to carry us to the deep old grooves of our inherited collective memory that Olson knew. So now when you go out for the adventures later this week into the surrounding mountains or fish or float one of our wild rivers, carry that vision forward. Carry the vision you had in your head as we, spoke, we started this. Hold it deep in your soul. Your connection with the wildness now will help us preserve our own humanity. Thank you very much. All right, thanks Rocky, appreciate the invitation, although I don't need to be convinced, but I'll take uh, the sound of wolves back in the Yellowstone versus an apocalyptic Blade Runner sunset. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, on to our last guest, so Brody Levin. Brody Levin is a professional skier, an athlete, explorer, and storyteller. He's built a bit of a reputation on his penchant for pushing the envelope and kind of his wholehearted embrace of uh, these humbling tests of endurance, which we colloquially call in my tribe Sufferfests. <laughs> From bike-powered ski expeditions to the Arctic to arduous treks to ski the last remaining snows of Uganda, to watch a film or expedition by Brody, uh, well, it's always a little bit of an entertaining insight into, well, the absurd. Um, but, you know, replete with the self-effacing humor you'd expect on such an endeavor. In his talk, he's for sure going to share some adventures with us all. But really what you'll see, what makes Brody unique is a, another higher calling. How he uses his platform for organizations like Protect Our Winners, the American Alpine Club. And he addresses, you know, why does an athlete step out of their ski boots and put on a suit and tie and step in front of Congress in Washington, D.C. to advocate for preservation of public lands or perhaps testify on the threats of climate change at state legislature? Why? Well, let's welcome Brody Levin to explain. Thank you, Terry. What Terry forgot to mention about my job title is that I completely made it up. Um, I mean, because let's be honest, a pro adventure skier. <laughs> the, to, to be honest, the uh, the first thing I'm, the first question I get usually when people ask me what I do for a living is like, wow, cool, a pro skier. So like, what do you do for a living? Like, how do you make money? You know, and I'm like, didn't you just a professional? Like, what don't we? But I mean, granted, those people don't usually have the context of the fact that I was raised in like a high alpine, um, rugged, mountainous environment of uh, northeastern Ohio. <laughs> and so now that you get that a little bit, it's, you know, it's easy to understand that, yes, it's actually my job. Uh, granted, it's one that I completely made up. Um, I've made my career by traveling to unexpected parts of the world to climb and ski mountains. Uh, like this one. Uh, this is my fifth day trekking through Uganda. I was tr looking for Africa's third highest peak. And typically as a professional climber, you're looking for the highest peak. So why would I be looking for the third highest peak? The third highest peak um, is called Margarita Peak and it's home to Africa's last snowy glacier. And I wanted to climb and ski it before that snowy glacier disappeared. Um, I'll give you a second to kind of let this all sink in here. Uh, there's snow in Africa, 
and, and I wanted to go see it. And the problem with getting there is that the mountain forms the border between Uganda and the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so you could obviously kind of only access it from one side. Um, so eventually, uh, another week after this photo was taken, after bashing my skis through the jungle, I was able to, to climb and ski that mountain. Because as a ski mountaineer, I do this entirely foot powered. I don't use chairlifts or helicopters or snowmobiles to reach the tops of these mountains. Um, I do it myself. Skiers like to joke that like the only high speed quads backcountry skiers use are those attached to our knees. <laughs> Which is a ski joke because we call chairlifts high speed quads and these are quads. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it'll take me weeks to climb a mountain that takes me just minutes to ski down. And thus, my definition of skiing is much different than most people's definition of skiing. But that approach to skiing is what's kind of given me this, this audience. And I tell stories to this audience through traditional media and social media, through new media, stories, events, photos, articles, and videos. Stories like places from, or like this. Um, this is the highest peak in Georgia. It's just over 17,000 feet tall. Uh, it's about an hour south of Atlanta. And uh, no, also a joke, this is the country of Georgia. Um, the other side of this mountain is uh, actually the country of Russia. And so this mountain forms the border, just like the one in Uganda, between Russia and Georgia. I took this picture about eight weeks ago at a small base camp we had put up. But this trip actually took me about eight months to plan. And I was in the country for over three weeks to try to ski one line that would ultimately take me one hour to ski. Granted, that line has been attempted by two parties much stronger than myself, and they both failed on it. And I was kind of thinking, what gives me the right to think that I can get up there and actually ski this thing? And it's my last day on the mountain, and the weather had been socked in throughout the entire course of the nearly month-long trip, and I was kind of getting ready to pack up, and suddenly the sun pops out. And I'm given this 18 hour weather window to climb and ski this mountain that's never been skied before. Kind of that, that feature that's dropping out of the clouds there. Um, and ultimately I'm able to do it. But, but why would I want to? Like why does that actually matter? Why would you go there to climb and ski a mountain? Pretty much just sit in a tent. When I was still a young boy, we used to look at snow on these hills. If they are all gone, one, there will be no work for me as a guide and there will be less money coming into the communities. If there could be anything to be done to make sure our glaciers are not gone completely, if we could join in hand and do it together, so that our glaciers remain there. I would be very grateful with that. As you can tell, it's not really about the climbing for me. It's not about the skiing for me. Those are just kind of the vehicles I use to see these places around the world. It's about these experiences that I get to have all over the world. Granted, these experiences have massive carbon footprints, right? The amount of gear that is shipped from all over to use, it's all made of plastic, and, and the fact that we have to have huge piles of food to go on these expeditions, let alone the travel to actually get there. But these experiences are also what make me care about our planet, and without them, I wouldn't feel the same way about it. And a lot of people see this as a catch-22, right? Like, you need to exploit the planet in order to want to protect it, but actually, it's not. For our trip to Africa, we hired or for our trip to Uganda specifically, we hired 25 porters. We hired two guides, two drivers. We hired a logistics company. We did what we could to support the local economy, but climate change is destroying their livelihood faster than we could support it in reality. But this isn't just bad for folks in Africa or along the coasts, and the people in this room know this. The effects of shorter and warmer winters are having real effects to not only our recreation, but to our economy. The ski industry in the United States is, is an $11.5 billion industry. And this is just a slice of what the Outdoor Industry Association says is an $887 billion outdoor recreation economy in the United States alone. Well, I live in Salt Lake City, and, and in Utah, our oil and gas industry 
is less than a quarter the size of our outdoor tourism industry. It hires, or excuse me, it employs about 4,900 people a year. The outdoor recreation economy employs over 110,000 people a year. But what happens on a bad snow year, right? Like we this past winter. Well, first of all, you can say the outdoor, uh, or excuse me, the national GDP is affected with a 10% decrease of what we contribute as the outdoor industry. Um, when there are consecutive bad winters, this effect obviously only snowballs. Snowballs, if you will. Small businesses and resorts across the country are having a hard time keeping up as these large resort conglomerates are diversifying their portfolio by picking up resorts around the country, trying to mitigate their risk. But in reality, are they really mitigating the risk or are they just postponing it? Low snow winters have real effects on the national GDP. But the real question is about Uganda. Did I actually ski? Oh, I skied. <laughs> I mean, if you want to call it that, because the snow, the quality of the snow, actually, let's just see the quality of the snow. I can explain. Yeah! This is my friend Mary. That is what I call skiing. <laughs> this is the end of a, an 1,100 vertical foot ski run that we hiked two weeks through the jungle to get to, the majority of which was just like this. Um, 16 out of the 17 hottest years on record have occurred since the turn of the millennium. And that means if you were born after 2000, you haven't yet experienced a normal temperature year. And this isn't good for the nearly 200,000 snow sport industry jobs. Last year, we saw Arctic temperatures that were regularly 50 degrees above average. But we don't need to talk about that because who cares about the Arctic? Because no one actually goes to the Arctic, right? Wrong. This is me at 11 p.m. digging my tent out of a blizzard in the Arctic. This is me a couple days later in Svalbard. This is the northernmost inhabited land on Earth. Um, this is actually sea ice in the background, which is frozen seawater that I had to ski across in order to make a first ascent and then a first descent of this couloir. Because not only do I go these, to these places like Svalbard, but these expeditions are what have changed the course of my entire life. And they're also what have changed the outdoor industry, because the outdoor industry thrives off these collective experiences that we have as individual people. We don't go out there as an $887 billion industry, we go out there as individuals, but we come back and contribute to this industry. Or here, I'm uh, skiing down the northernmost active volcano on Earth. This is uh, called Berenberg, and it's on a Norwegian island that's uninhabited. That took me five days of sailing from Iceland to reach, which is a great way to get super seasick. And you arrive, and the island is 39 miles wide between this volcano and the mountain on the other end of the island. It's two miles wide, and not a soul lives on it. So you get there after these like five miserable days of sailing, and you step foot off the boat, and within like a couple hours, you're feeling better until you realize that, like, okay, we've got five days on this island before we have to turn around and sail back. This is at, I think, 55 degrees north latitude. This is a little bit below that on the uh, Norwegian archipelago of Lofoten, which is also in the Arctic. And let's just kind of go here for a second. So we're riding a bicycle filled with camping gear, pulling a trailer filled with ski gear, with the goal of riding around the circumference of these islands, connecting them by bike, climbing and skiing the mountains, mountains along the way. And the idea being that we want to make a film about doing this. But in reality, we end up making a film about how dismal the snow conditions are in the Arctic. And if it's bad at 60 degrees north elevation or latitude, you know that it's going to be bad in Lake Tahoe or southern Vermont or Colorado or even in Alaska. This is the first year in the 38 years of the ski area where we, where we effectively had no top to bottom skiing. There's been years where it's been late, you know, early February, mid-February. Usually March turns on, we get a bunch of good storms, and we have some great skiing to finish out the year. This year that just never happened. In a normal year, I'd be standing on four to five feet of snow. It'd be snow from where I am all the way to the top. We'd have usually long days, plenty of sunshine. 
um, in between storms and lots of fantastic skiing and riding. So obviously this year is a drastic difference than that. And so before you know it, we're sitting up here and we've got, you know, what looks like perfectly skiable conditions at the top 300, 300 400 vertical feet. But as you get to the bottom, it's just grass. It's, it's almost heartbreaking. You know, you get your first two, 300 verts, some great turns in, some powder turns, and then you get down below and you're trying to traverse rock and gullies and, you know, saplings and that sort of stuff. Eagle Crest with snow has the terrain, has the access to a terrain of, you know, as good if not better than most ski areas in the country. It's really amazing what is offered in such a small footprint. We've only got four lifts, we're 1,700 vertical feet. But what you can access within that ski area boundary or just outside of it is second to none. There have been some good days with some decent turns. It just hasn't been able enough to actually open the chairlift at the bottom of the mountain. So people have been coming up here and hiking and making shorter laps on all the, all the, the snow that we do have. It's one of those, you know, at, at 33 degrees, we can get an inch and a half of rain. But at 31 degrees, that's you know, a foot and a half of snow. The, the winter this year, it fits a trend that we have been seeing. It's climate change. And the change for us here in Alaska happens to be primarily a warming trend. A trend over the course of 10 years, you see the average temperature go up a half a degree. From a climate standpoint, that's a big deal. There's always going to be snow. It's just a matter of how high up into the mountains you're going to have to go to get to it, or how far north you're going to have to go on some of the flatter areas. We really we live and die by that one degree. And this year, we just never got it. Riding that super fine line between epic and total shit, is, you know, we're, we've just kind of started teetering the wrong way. And as a He's professional a snowboarder. snowboarder, I'm seeing it. And it's not like I live in one spot where I'm like, oh, wow, it was, it was warm in Mount Baker this year. I mean, I was. I was in Europe for a couple weeks. I was in Japan for a couple weeks. I've been in Alaska for a few weeks. You know, I was in Washington, Montana. I was in Tahoe in, around Christmas. Everywhere I go, everybody else that's skiing and snowboarding and also aware of that fine line are talking about it. It's changing, and it's changing fast. So my friend Lucas is saying there that is that this is kind of common knowledge throughout the industry because whether you're a weekend skier, you ski once a year, or you ski every day, or you snowboard, you're seeing these effects. And climate change is also affecting the safety of our climbing and skiing routes all over the world. Rockfall is more common due to the more drastic freeze-thaw cycles that we're experiencing after warming temperatures. Avalanche conditions become more dangerous with these drastic freeze-thaw cycles and these drastic temperature swings that we're seeing regularly. I'm here today um, on behalf of a group that I volunteer with called Protect Our Winters. Uh, Protect Our Winters is a nonprofit organization that's mobilizing the outdoor sports community against climate change. And the coolest part about it is that it's actually working. We use these platforms that professional athletes have created through our athletic achievements in order to leverage our networks for environmental benefits. So this is a typical Protect Our Winters group uh, after a day on Capitol Hill. But you're like, why would any politicians want to listen to these guys, right? Let me tell you a couple of good ways to get people to listen to you. Bring in gold medals or ice cream. <laughs> um, Protect Our Winters uh, rep er, acknowledges the fact that our jobs as professional athletes is to be the best athletes that we can possibly be. But increasingly, like within our world, we're starting to see demands from our fans, from the consumers, to be more than just like bodies hucking ourselves off of cliffs. Instead, to be using our brains as well. So we're working toward these systematic changes that are necessary to save our growing and thriving, but also dying industry. Maybe you guys have seen signs like these before. The one that's hidden, um, you can kind of read. There was other ones that said things like, coal feeds my children and coal puts food on my table. And my favorite one, coal is beautiful. This was at a, uh, an EPA hearing in Salt Lake City. Uh, I went to testify because they were coming in to hear comments about closing two coal-fired power plants in southern Utah that were polluting the air so bad that it was causing like visible haze to our five southern Utah national parks. And we were seeing decreases in tourism from these two coal-fired power plants. Little did I know when I showed up to like make my two-minute comment, uh, Carbon County, which is actually the name of a county, um, had bust in their coal miners during a paid day off to stand and picket until it was their opportunity to speak. So they had their signs, 
but we also have ours. This is at the People's Climate March in DC last year. If our generation has nothing else, I think it has resolve, particularly in the outdoor arena, where we are working and volunteering hard to actually try to move the needle. From inner city New Jersey to California and all over the country, I've spoken to like tens of thousands of students over the past few years um, on behalf of Protect Our Winters, this group that I'm here today for. Uh, we show ski movies, we hand out beanies, we quiz the students on their climate knowledge, and then we present them with this really digestible and compelling climate discussion. The assembly is provided at no cost to any school that wants it, and the person presenting usually has like a gold medal or a first descent to tell the students about between these like Bill Nye the Science Guy clips that are just as interesting to be honest. And we're seeing it firsthand, like the future is listening. And this is how we are working to make the students care. Because they're also acting and we know we aren't acting alone. We work with some of the largest brands in the outdoor industry. We travel the world seeing the effects of climate change firsthand. And we have these social media audiences of millions and millions of people. When we want to spread a message, we're able to do it quickly and we're able to do it efficiently. And now we have a really good message to spread. Um, Protect Our Winters Action Fund is something that was just started. It's a 501c4 and they're diving headfirst into the midterm elections across the country and across the aisle, uh, tackling key political races. The same determination that we as individual athletes are applying to our training on the mountain, we're now applying to the elections to our audiences that we have these receptive groups of people that are listening to what we have to say and we're trying to share with them these positive messages. And we're trying to do it all for the sake of the climate. And hopefully, like in the mountains, we're able to do this with the humility and teamwork and hopefully a little bit of endurance uh, that we've learned up there. Thank you so much for being here, guys. I really appreciate it.